Good morning, everybody. This is the Saturday morning webinar, part two of a two-part series of uh, how and where to draw mid-band boxes for trades on the charts in the futures markets. First, we've got to knock out our standard disclaimer so we can get over to the charts and start looking at trade setups. All communications from Viper Trading Systems are for educational purposes only. Futures trading does involve risk, and there is a risk of loss. Nothing contained in this webinar or other webinars, including the live trading room, are to be construed as investment or trading advice. And of course, everyone does know that you do trade at your own sole discretion. Alrighty then. <clears throat> Without further ado, I'm going to get over here to a... Oh, this is gold. I thought it was a Russell. <laughs> That's all right. We'll start with gold today. Okay. So what I want to do is, if you haven't seen part one of uh, this uh, series on uh, Thursday night, uh, I suggest you watch it. Um, I do have another two-part series that was similar to this called, um, I think it was two, two or three weeks ago, if you go back and look, Maximizing gain, Gains, Minimizing Trades, where we talk about how to, uh, how to do a lot of this. But before I get into it, I'm, I'm going to just sort of recap um, the different types of trades that we have, in particular retracement trades, and this would be in addition to mid-band trades. So we're going to look at mid-band trades, but we're going to talk about all kinds of different kinds of trades too, which I think will be helpful. So let's do this. Let's start right here with this. Um, let's look at this downtrend because th th there's several examples of trades here. Um, <clears throat> Here we come down, and uh, a mid-band trade would be considered. There's, there's basically when you think about, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it like this, and most of you have heard me do this before. I'm going to use this one as an example. <clears throat> in a downtrend, we know that in order for a trade to qualify for retracement, it has to close above line two, which is the thin line right here and it has to close above the stealth line. So in the case, as, as far as a minimum retracement is concerned. <clears throat> excuse me. So clearly right in here, these bars qualify for a minimum retracement in a downtrend, okay? They close above line two, check. Close above stealth, check. So most of you know, okay, so, so uh, this is the indicators on the chart, four range chart, we're looking at gold. And the bands are 1, 2, 3, 4, mid-band, 5, 6, 7, 8, top of the last top uh, band right here, the outermost band. Line 2 is here, oops, mid-band, and line 6 is here. So you can think of those lines as kind of in the middle band as the sweet spot in terms of retracements. So I'm going to extend the box to look like this. <clears throat> So what you're going to find, it, let's say, for, is that we'll look at both uptrend and downtrend. When it comes to retracements, this is the minimum criteria here. That's considered a shallow retracement. You could characterize it as a shallow retracement. Mid-band would come and at least touch the mid-band and in some cases sit on it and oscillate around it for some period of time like such. That would be the mid-band trade. We're going to talk a lot about that, right? And then you have deep retracements. Deep retracements could go as far as the outermost band in the other direction, like this. Now, we've talked about this kind of looking like a strike zone, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in, a, in a baseball or softball game. Uh, the knees would be down here as you stand at the plate. This would be the plate right here, standing at the plate with the baseball you know, fastball coming at you or whatever. This is your waist. This is the middle. And up here would be your shoulders. So that's a good, healthy way of thinking about retracements. So let's look at some examples together. Here, we kiss the mid-band and it rolls over. But it only did it with two bars. So that's the other challenge. So you have several challenges when you think about retracements. You have <clears throat> not only the depth of retracement, but the timing of how long the retracement takes. Uh, 
Sometimes it can be as little as just two bars. Right here is a good example. Here we have arguably one, two, three, four, five, six bars in this little box right here. Here's another good example over here where it kisses the mid band and then rolls over. One, two, three, and this one kind of dinked around in there. You got four, five, six, but then it broke out depending on how far and how long you drew the box or where you, you know, how many candles you put in it. We'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> Here's another one where it was looking like it was starting to go up. Comes below the mid band and just sits here like such. See it? Now, now I'm going to ask a question just to make sure everybody's awake and to get some feedback because I think that something is the elephant in the room and needs to be addressed. So let's get that right out in the air. What would you say, in your opinion, team, everyone here today, is the most challenging thing when it comes to drawing and taking a region box trade? What's the most challenging part of doing that? Just take a minute and, and think about it and type something in, and, and I have a pretty good idea of what I think it is. But I do want to make sure that we're going to address it. In terms of taking region box trades, what is the what is the toughest, what's the most challenging part of seeing them and taking them, in your opinion? <clears throat> is it the position of where they're located? Is it how many bars does it take to form it? Is it where the top and the bottom of the box is? You know, drawing the box itself? What would be some of the concerns? I'm just going to, while you're typing that in, I'm going to scroll back and forth here. Looking for different types of trade setups. The height of the box, Richard says. Okay, good. In fact, let me get a little pen. I'm going to jot these down. Because I have the, I think I have a pretty good idea what some of them are. And I do want to address them because I understand that when you're trying to find region box setups, it can be challenging. No, I totally understand it. Uh, okay, so height of the box. Um, how far is the price going to go to the entry? Okay, so that's depth of retracement. I know, I knew that was an issue. Knowing which way to trade if the market is going sideways and then sideways seems to be dominating the trend. Okay, so sideways. Uh, when they bounce around like the box you drew at 1216, seems like they may want to fake you and not sure whether it's a reversal or not. Reversals. Okay. Kathy says all the above. So I got height of retracement, depth of retracement. No, height of box, depth of retracement, sideways markets and reversals. When to start drawing the box, first bar, second bar, etc. Top and bottom, head, belt, and knees, time and number of candles. Okay, good. Now I'm going to get, try to let, let, I'm going to do this in a systematic way because I think for anybody to you know grasp what we're doing here, let's try to have a little system that we do together. And let's do some all together, and then I'll and then I'm going to have you do a few, and I'm going to try as best I can to address all four of these concerns in the next 45 minutes. Now, <clears throat> let's do it like this. I'm going to look at a series of retracements, and we're going to look at them all together, and we're going to di dissect them in great detail. Okay. Now, for the purposes of this discussion, let's not be too concerned that this is gold, and let's not be too concerned that this is late at night, in the middle of the night. Let's just strictly together look at the patterns themselves, because once you know these patterns, they will work on any instrument. 6A, 6B, Russell, doesn't matter. They'll work on everything. You just got to understand the concept of how this works, right? Let's do it a couple of different ways. Clearly, you can see that gold went into an uptrend right here. 
I think we all would agree that that's pretty clear that we are in an uptrend because you've broken all these resistance levels. The background is green. You're stair stepping up. Bars are predominantly blue. All the criteria are met for uptrend. Yes. So I, I know it's explicitly clear, but I'm going to say it anyway. So in an uptrend, we take longs equal longs only. And you are looking at retracements. Now, when we start to look at this retracement right here, let's dissect it together. One of the things that you might find helpful to help you see this is to take a line or a ray, and I'm going to use a ray in this case, and you place the top of the ray right here. Okay? And then you take the ray, and you can do this when it starts to paint, when it starts to retrace. Can you see how I've drawn the ray and it starts to go over the tops of these candles? Think of this as like a downtrend retracement line in an uptrend. Okay? Let's not even think about a box just yet. Let's just think about the way the market is retracing. Now let's look at each candle as it forms. Clearly we can see that this point right here is the apex of the thrust move up. Yes? Now we can see that there's a series of bars that start to close down, moving away from this high point right here. Yes? Closing down. Now, it doesn't necessarily, when I say downward retracement, in some cases a bar can close up in the downward retracement. So it's not necessarily closing down. However, the tops and bottoms of the candles are successfully getting lower right? So what I'm trying to say is that even though this bar here closed up, it still had a lower high and a lower low, yes? This bar right here, right? See how they're all going down? Down, 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 all the way until where? Which bar in this retracement pattern is no longer going down? I'll give you three choices. A, this bar right here. B, that bar. C, that bar. Or D. Which bar is no longer following the subsequent lower high, lower low pattern in the retracement? I'm showing four bars here. Which one of the four bars is no longer going down? A, B, C, or D? Which one of those four bars? I'll give you five seconds. Type in a letter, please. The bar that's no longer following the downward pattern in the retracement, A, B, C, or D bar. This is not a trick question. There is an answer here, and you should see it. The ray should help you see it. <clears throat> I think you I think if you try to start doing the ray thing it's going to help a lot of you. You can see how simple that was. While you're thinking about the answer, let's talk about time. So the apex of this thrust occurred roughly at 2241. That was the beginning of the retracement. This bar here formed at 2312. So you're looking at over 20 minutes. In this particular, because it was overnight, it was gold overnight, okay? So this pattern took a long, what I'm saying is you just didn't have two seconds to think about this. There was plenty of time to watch this retracement. Okay, back to the answer to the question, D. Now, let's go back and talk about why. A is clearly still going down. I don't see anybody that typed in an A. Good. B is still clearly going down. I didn't see anybody that typed in a, a, a B, so that's good. Some of you typed in C. I, most of you, almost all of you typed in a D, which is correct. This is the bar that is no longer going down. Now, why is it not C? Okay, let's look at it in detail.
and this might have helped you. I should, probably should have done this before I asked that question, so my apologies. In terms of going down in a downward retracement, we talked about the fact that the series of bars should be sequentially lower in, in uh, uh, tops and bottoms. So asking you this question now that you see it all blown up, is the top and bottom of this bar right here above or below the top and bottom of this bar right here? Is the top and bottom of this bar lower than the top and the bottom of this bar right here? Yes or no? I'm not talking about where to enter. We're not talking about the trade yet. Everybody's like, well, where do I get in and how do I do this? Don't worry about any of that. Just forget about all that right now. Where I think the confusion is, is how to see the retracement and then what to do about it. You can't figure out what to do about it if you don't understand the retracement process itself. Right? The boxes and lines don't matter if you can't see it. You've got to be able to see it first. That's where everybody's struggling. I know that's why you're struggling. I know that. It's lower. Bar C, A is still going down. We all see that. B is still going down. We all see that. And from a technical point of view, this, this bar is still lower than this one. So C was lower. That's not a reversal bar. This is the reversal bar. Bar D was the reversal bar. See how this bar closes up? And the high of it is above here? And the low of it touches it? Now, if you had drawn an actual ray tool using Object Trader, you would be filled long on the close of this bar right here. And that is another tool that really gets under, uh, underutilized, is the ray tool. And it can help you if you're struggling with boxes. If the box itself, drawing and seeing the box is an issue for you, there are other tools in, in uh, Object Trader that you can use, like the ray tool, and it might solve that problem for you. You can also use limit orders. You can use a market buy order. So if the box is an issue and you find that a hindrance to taking trades, you should explore other avenues to get in. Okay? That's what I'm trying to say. Don't let the box hinder you. It's designed to be a help. Now let's talk about thinking about where the top of the box might be. Let's do it this way. Obviously it's not going to be here, but I'm going to start here. Now all of these bars... As they follow the ray tool, the, the, the ray, the descending ray down, you can think of them as possible tops of boxes. 2301 is confusing. This bar right here, is this confusing? That one? Well, it doesn't break the ray. Does it break the ray? Right? I mean, you, you, you can't be so tight on this thing. You, I mean, they, they follow these ABC patterns. You're going to get you're going to get an A, you're going to get a B, and normally you get a C. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes they just go straight down. You have to allow, you can't, see, this is the other trick with the ray tool. I'm using the ray to try to help you. I hope it doesn't confuse you. But you have to allow the market to retrace. You can't, if you draw the, some people draw these rays way too tight, and they get faked into trades. This is the other thing that can hurt you. So what he's saying is, if you drew the ray like that, super steep, would you have gotten in this bar here? Probably not. It didn't close up. See it? If you drew it loose, it didn't get you in until here. This is the bar that closes up outside the ray. Yeah, you have to practice this, Greg. Uh, everybody, you know, it, this isn't something that you're just going to look at for, for the first time and say, oh, I see exactly how to do that. That's crystal clear. I know exactly what to do. What I'm trying to do in this exercise is help you see how retracements happen because you can't really draw boxes and take trades until you see and understand how the retracement unfolds, and that's what we're doing. So anyway, back to the top of the box. So, you know, what you could do if you're going to use the box and not the ray, or use the ray purely for visualization and not to take the trade, is follow the, follow the ray down with a line, visualizing it as the potential top of a box, right? At what point could you draw the top of the box? Let me give you a couple options. A would be this line. B would be this line. If you're going to draw a box here, 
would the top of the box be located at line A, this line right here, or line B, this line right here? In other words, are you following the tops of the candles down to, at some point, draw a box? A, top of the box, B, top of the box. We all see clearly now that the bottom of the retracement was this candle right here. Would you be able to put it on that candle? Probably not. Because at the time it formed, you didn't know at the time that it formed that it was the bottom. Not until this bar formed right here. A or B? Just type in a letter. <laughs> I mean, it's either A or B. So just look at it and type in a letter. If you, if you were watching this retracement, would you put the top of your box here, A, or would you put the top of your box B? A simple question. So if it was B, your box would look like this. If it was A, your box would look like this. It would be bigger. It would look like that. They're both good answers, by the way. That was a little bit of a trick question. They're both good answers. It could either be A or B. They're both good top of boxes. The difference is, is, is where you would get filled, right? If you're more aggressive, your box would be uh, uh, at B. A is this one right here. B is right here. B would be the more aggressive. In other words, as you follow it down, you draw it, and you're filled. Just like the ray trade, you'd be filled on this bar right here. If you had the larger, less aggressive box, depending on how you drew it, you might have been filled here, but you would have been definitely filled on the close of this bar right here. So it's really a function. You're going to have to practice with your in instrument that you work with. All instruments are different. The retracements are not all the same. This is really the trick. This is the juice. This is the secret sauce of taking trades right here. We're looking at it. This is the heart of the matter. Let's do a couple more together. Is this helping? Yeah, it was definitely a long trade, Lewis. Yeah, there's no question. We were an uptrend. We're looking for long. Let's do a couple more together. Let's do ones that look different. This gives me a better look at how to substantiate the trigger. Okay, good. All right, good. Let's look at another one together. Now, the first thing in the way that you look at this is that even though you have a sequence of retracement bars, we don't care about it in an uptrend until it does what? A retracement has to do something, has to meet certain criteria before it even counts as a potential trade entry. What does it have to do? So, so let's let me help you out. Let me do it this way. Here, let me let me do it this way. We're looking at bars. Here, let me. Here's here's how I think this is going to help. Let's do this. Okay. Oops, wrong way. Let's do it this way. Okay. All right. Here we go. This bar. Tell me when a bar starts to qualify for you even to consider taking an entry. I see your answers coming in, Mario, Greg, Brian, Lewis. They, those are good. Those are right. Those are right on. <coughs> Excuse me. You tell me. I'm going to. I'm going to take this arrow and move it down in the retracement, and you tell me, you type in an N for now, N for now, meaning that now you can start thinking about a bar, considering it for trade entry, okay? This one, well, that's obviously a no. That's the apex of the move, okay? How about that one? Is that Can you consider that? Is that Can they be considered for an entry? No, I don't see any, I don't see any nows, okay? How about that one? Can you consider that for an entry? I don't see any answers. Good. How about this one? Can this bar now be considered for an entry, yes or no? Yes or no? How did I get paused? Can everybody see me moving my arrow? Let me go back. Now it's okay. Okay, this, this bar, this bar. This bar, this bar. Which one of all these bars can now be considered as potential putting an entry in play? 
the last bar. Good. This one. Why? Well, now, our criteria is that in an uptrend has to close below stealth. So now let's look at this. So this bar closed below stealth. However, it is still above line 6. So this bar is not considered a candidate for entry for a box or array or whatever. Right? Now this bar closes below stealth, check mark 1, line 6, check mark 2. Right? So when it's retracing and you're considering and and I suggest I suggest you do this. This would be a good exercise for everybody to do. This would be a most excellent exercise for everybody to try. Take your instrument of choice. And I would say let's do it this way. Let's try to get a let's try to get a repeatable uh, you know, way to do this. Let's take our ray tool, find the tops of the candles, give it some wiggle room, take a line, as you practice on your chart and you're looking at your instruments of choice, whether it be gold or crude or, you know, what, I, what doesn't matter, whatever you're trading and you're learning the patterns that it retraces, take a line just like I'm showing right here and then follow the bars down. As you follow the sequence of bars, here's what should be going through your mind. Is this the top of the box? Right? Is this the top of the box? Well, the obvious answer is no. Until, in terms of a retracement, until the bars break line six, you don't even need to really care about them. Because if the bar only gets, here, let me give you an example. Look at all these bars right here. Are any of them in consideration for a potential another trade entry? Well, this one breaks stealth, but it does it close below line six? No, none of them. None of these bars qualify. You don't go deep enough here. There is no trade here. The trade was here. Did everybody see that? Right? Okay, let's go back over here. Here, we're coming down. We can see the bars. Before this bar forms right here, we don't care. None of these bars matter. What I'm trying to say is if, if it came to here in line six and still then it bounced and went up higher like that, it, it, it won't matter. Here, let's look, let's look at a couple more. How about over here? Are these potential trade entry bars? Well, no. No, they're above line six and they're almost above stealth. No, these aren't line, they aren't trade. Here, let's do another one. Let's go and let's go. Let's do another one. Let's do another exercise very similar to what we just did. Here's the apex of the next thrust. You tell me when there is a bar that you could start considering to take a trade. Typing in N for now. Or yes, Y, either, either way. Whenever you think that the bars are ready to consider for trade, you tell me. This one. This one. This one. I don't see any comments. Okay, good. This one, this one, this one. I see a lot of yeses coming in. Good, good, excellent. This one is kind of on the cusp. This is on the cusp too. It, it, it went down. It technically closed right on six. So you're right on sort of the buzzer right there, you know. Here, you know, you're kind of flirting with stealth in line six. Technically, it closed below both, sort of. But definitely that bar right there. Now you're in consideration for trade. Let's do. Let's keep with our exercise. We're going to draw a ray, retracement ray, like such, making sure we stay above the tops of the candles in the retracement. That's okay. No, I see Shane. Some of you said that you, some of you came in on this bar right here, and I, I can see it. It technically closed. It's, it, if you said stealth was kind of right here and line six was right there, technically that would qualify. You're right on the cusp of acceptability. Right. Let's take our line and retrace with the bars, showing us where a potential top of a box might be here. We wouldn't even really need to do it on these bars because the bars that are above here don't matter. Right. So there is no box to consider up there. You don't even consider the top of a box until it breaks, right? Like you wouldn't start to consider a box here, would you? No. You wouldn't consider a box over here. No. There's, you haven't met the criteria to get in, right? 
Let's continue over here. So let's not even talk about these bars up here because they don't matter. The first one to close technically down was that one. Could that be a top of a box? Yes. Let's do another one. How about right here? Could that form a top of a box? Sure. Now let's draw the, let's draw the two boxes. If you drew it here, or you put a limit order in above that bar, you would be filled long on the close of this bar right here. And if you used a ray tool, a box, a ray, and a limit order would all be filled long right there. If you use the, the, the further bar out, you would have a larger box that would look something like this. In that case of the larger bar, you wouldn't be filled long until the close of that bar right there. Bar close is good too, Lewis. You could use bar close. You could turn on bar close. That's another option. You can use the ray tool. You can use the box. And you can use limit orders. Limit orders would be that you put a limit order in. Let me get another line. And the limit order could sit, you know, above the each candle as it subsequently went down. You could put a limit order in like that. You'd be filled here. If you use the upper bar, you put a limit order here. You'd be filled on the, on in this bar right here. Yeah, there's plenty of tools to get in. But what I'm trying to spend a lot of time on here is to really understand how a retracement unfolds. Now, those were all pretty clean. Let's do some retracements that aren't so clean. Let's look at a, an example of a downtrend that isn't, isn't so clean. It's a little more messy because they're all not nice like this, right? They, that's where you get confused. When you get a messy one that's just sort of whipping all around, you really can't figure out what to do. Let's, let's, look, at, let's look at a couple of those. Let me see if I can find a messy one. Well, I'm going to work on a couple of different messy ones, and let's look at the short side of things and talk about how some of them work out and some of them don't. Not every trade works out. We know that, right? But you got to practice. you got to practice getting in. you got to find the methodology that, that helps you see and take the trades. Let's look at some examples of messy ones. Yeah, the buy and sell buttons on OT are at market. Now they get filled at market. Okay, let's look at um, let's look at another gold when it was trending down. Let's look at different examples of retracement trades. Um, I'm going to start with this one in the middle. We're going to use similar methodology as we did. Uh, on the other setups on the long side, only the ray is going to look more like this. Let's look at this one. We take the ray. Now, let's blow this up like we did the other ones. I think it really helps to really get, is, is, I don't know, is this helping? Going bar by bar like this in a retracement, so you really see them good. Because if it is, I'll keep doing it. I mean, I think, I think putting a ray in probably helps helps you see the retracement a lot better, huh? All right, let's let's do the similar exercise as we did in the uptrend. Only this is the downtrend now. So the trend is, okay, the trend is down, and we're looking for shorts in a retracement, okay? Now you tell me, you type in when you can start considering a bar for a trade. This one. 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 All right, I'm going to stop there. From a technical point of view, these two are on the cusp because you're sitting right. You're, you you did close above. Now, just to be clear, okay, this is line two. This thin line is line two. This thick, snaky line is stealth. 
So our rule criteria is it's got to close above both of those. So from a technical point of view, yes, those two are in consideration. However, they're right on the cusp. I like to see the full body of, of the candle be above. So if you're looking at the full body, you know, the wick, the body, everything has got to be above six in stealth. I mean, I think we should probably add that to our criteria. Bars that are kind of dinking around, sitting on it like this, they're really, you're, you're on the cusp of not being acceptable. It's not, this isn't deep enough. You see, because the distance between here and here, let, let me explain why. Some of you might be saying, well, why is this criteria? Why do you have it in the first place? Because there has to be a sufficient amount of, of pullback off of the thrust move for you to have, so the assumption is, the assumption is, that where, wherever it retraces to, that theoretically it should come back down and test the swing that it bounced off of. That's sort of the prevailing thought around retracements, is that it's, there's a likelihood, a strong likelihood, that wherever it stops retracing to, that it should come back and test this and possibly break it, which it did over here. Okay, but let's not talk about that right now. So what I'm trying to say is this, is if you think about it just from just looking at it, you can see that if you only went to here and you took a short, how much meat on the bone do you have for it to get even to here by the time you get filled with slippage and commission? Is there any meat on the bone in this trade? That's what I'm asking you right here. That's why we say you've got to go above here. See? Line two and stealth, and up here, line six and stealth up here. That's why we're saying it's got to go deeper. You've got to get some meat on the bone here to take the trade, right? And there just isn't. Now, there'll be cases in, an, in a huge run where it'll only pull back to there, and then the thing runs 100 ticks. But you know what? That's rare. You can't build your trading system around something that happens like, you know, 2% of the time. You need a solid foundation you can rely on that's going to be solid 75, 80, 80 plus percent of the time. That's what you want to trade off of, right? All right, so let's get all these off of here. Everybody understand the logistics of why you have criteria like that? Everybody understand that now, right? Okay, good. So now we're, we're, now we're closing above, above uh, line two and stealth. Bars are closing above it. We're getting a little bit of an A, B, C, D, E pattern on our retracement. It's staying above our ray, yes? So now we start thinking, now that we're above it, we can start thinking about boxes, limit orders, and entries. Where are we going to get in? Right? Now, let's do another exercise. In this retracement, which bar is the reversal bar? A, B, or C. Which bar in the A, B, C bars reverses the retracement uptrend retracement in the down overall context of the downtrend move? Which is the reversal bar that could be considered as a potential entry bar for short? A, this bar right here. B, this bar right here. C, this bar right here. Just type in a letter. Remember our criteria. In the case of a, of a down retracement in an uptrend, we needed to see the bars that now reverse the pattern of the A, B, C, D, E retracement that's occurring here. I'll give you another second. Which one of those bars reverses the uptrend retracement pattern in um, uh, taking the short? Taking the short. Okay, the answer is C. Now, That's, that's really, I'm going to just excruciatingly, get excruciatingly, and I would suggest that if you have time over the weekend and into next week, you've got to spare a couple of 5, 10, 15 minutes laying around that you want to really look at charts. Go into your chosen instrument that you like to trade and blow up the detail, just like I'm doing right here, just like this. And you take your ray tool and you put that ray tool, just, just like I'm showing it right here. 
you position it, normally it's going to be right around a 45 degree angle. Okay, so what does that mean? Here's 90 degrees, and here's zero degrees. Notice how the angle of the ray is almost right in the middle. You see this ray? You see how it's like almost right, almost perfectly at 45 degrees? Now, of course, there's going to be times where it's a little steeper, and there's going to be times when it's a little bit, but this is a good rule of thumb to think about. You want your line to be somewhere right around 45 degrees on that retracer, plus or minus. Like I said, you know, some of them are going to be a little thing, and some are going to be a little thing. All right, so this is the entry bar right here. On the ray tool, you would have been filled short on the close of this. Oh, oops, wrong tool. Sorry, hold on. It's supposed to be a circle. <clears throat> See how we break the ray. Now, this is the first bar that came. Let's look at this bar right here. The apex of the retracement. Is the top and bottom of this bar above this bar and this bar? Yes. This one is not. Let's think about where the bottom of our box is, because when you're getting short, we care about the bottom of the box, yes? Top of the box really doesn't matter, unless you're going both ways. Unless you're going like, to go both ways, then the top of the box does matter. But let's let's talk about the case of the short. Now we don't care about these bars down here, so I'm not going to ask you. These all these none of these qualify until here. You tell me to stop. You put in an S when you think you've reached where the bottom of the box should stay. In other words, that where you that's this is what you put in an S. I'll go bar by bar. Okay, here, 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 here. Here, where should the bottom of the box be? Let's do it a different way. Let's do it. That, that might not work so good for you. Let's do an ABC thing. That seems to work better. Would the bottom of your box be A here, B here, C here? A, B, or C? And that's the ascending lines. A would be, where would the bottom of your box be drawn? If you're going to draw a region box here. If you use the ray tool, you're already in. A, B, or C? All right, time's up. I see a lot of B's. Yes, B, I think B is the optimal answer. Now, why would B be better than C, and why would B be better than A? Now, as you're following, it, it could have, so here, here's, the way, here's, the way it's, here's the way it's going to go, and this is why I think it's important to practice this. And this is something we should talk about here that's going to prevent you getting in prematurely on a trade that you don't want to get in. The line, if you notice how I drew this line, as the, as the bottom of the box line was ascending in the retracement, notice how it followed candles that were close to the ray. Okay, this is the other thing I want to talk about. Notice how the candles are close to or touching the ray as they ascend. Here's another example of one here. This doesn't meet the criteria. It's not long enough, but see the bottom of the candle is close to it. Why is this important? Well, if you put the bottom of the box, if you follow the bottoms of candles, and you put a bottom of a box here, you may be filled prematurely short in the midst of a longer, more, a deeper retracement, right? So it's got to follow the ray. You've got to follow the bars that are close to the ray. So in other words, is this bar too far away from the ray to count? Yes. Everybody see that? You don't want your box there, because if you put your box there, you would actually be short when this bar formed right here. You didn't reverse. You haven't reversed yet. The reversal is right here. If you had the bottom of the box at B right here, you'd also be filled on that bar right there. You want this ray to be broken. I mean, that's really the bottom line, <laughs> okay? That's the whole reason you draw this ray. You want that ray to be broken. 
Now, let's talk about the follow-on to the trade. Let's say you're filled short on the, on the close of this bar right here. And let's use a number, and let's talk about what happens subsequently to being filled. Let's say you got filled at uh, 12.02.90, uh, 0290, 0290 short. Now, did you get a scalp off? Well, you got all the way down here to 0220. That's about seven ticks. So if you had a six tick scalp, it's possible you got a six ticker off. Your initial stop is generally 12 ticks. So let's go 12 ticks above here, and I would put you up at uh, 12 ticks would be uh, two, three, uh, 0410. So your initial stops are sitting way up here. Now, we have a thing that we do that we say, and some of you know this and some of you do it, and some of you maybe don't know it and some of you don't do it, is that after your scalp gets taken out, in this case, I don't know, it's five, six, seven ticks, you just barely got it taken out, you take your initial stop down to two ticks behind your entry. So your initial stop would come down here. Okay? Now, in that scenario, this retracement here would probably take out your second contract. See how it breached it? However, if you don't do that, if you didn't do that, and you left your initial stop way up here, where it was initially placed, then you would have this would have been one continuous trade and you just stayed in here. Everybody see that? Now, let's say you're taken out. Let's say you had you came down two ticks behind your entry. And this thing wicks you and just takes you out. Is there another re-entry? If your scalp is 8, then it wouldn't have moved. Then this is one continuous trade, Brian. Let's say that your scalp was bigger. Okay, let's see. here's your initial stop at 0410. Okay, 12 ticks above your entry on the close that bar at 0290, right? 12 ticks to 0410. It comes down, you get, this is like 7 ticks or whatever. And you had an 8 tick. You had an eight tick scalp target that was sitting right here and it just misses it. Under that scenario, if you don't move your initial stop, this retracement you don't care about because it never gets it. Kisses the midband one more time right here and rolls over and breaks down again. If it nipped you, could you have gotten back in here? Yes. That's the second kiss of a midband. That's a re entry point if it nicked you out right here. Right? Nicks you out, dinks around, comes over here, and it sat here for a while. I mean, you're looking at 15.23 to 16, that's almost an hour. This is overnight. This is really super slow. I'm just using this as an example. Robert, that really varies per instrument. He's saying should you use an 8 or a 10 tick? What do you use for the scalp? That's a function of your instrument. It's different for every instrument. Generally, it's going to be between 5 and 10. The sweet spot being, I'd say, in the 6 five, six, seven, eight area. But um, like, for instance, so what, I'm not trying to be evasive. You're like, well, you're not answering the question. So let me ask you, think about this intuitively. Would the scalp target on ES be the same as the scalp target on NASDAQ? Well, think about it. How much does ES move? We have a spectrum here of movement, right? very large movement and volatility let's do let's do it like this let's just put in it think of it this way like a spectrum okay low volatility and way at the other end you have very large volatility huge movements big swings in this spectrum right so let's put some instruments in here and talk about it for just one second. We're going to pause and do this real quick. So at the lower end, you're going to put ES, right? That baby hardly moves. I mean, it could stay in an eight tick range for half the morning. That is about as slow as it gets. This is this is this is tortoise mode, <laughs> right? Right? Now, I don't mind it. You know, if you if you like slower markets, ES is the market for you, right? And at the other end of the spectrum would be what? Nasdaq, Spazzy. Spazzy Nazi, right? That would be way over here. I mean, you, you get 200 tick runs in the morning from Spazzy. 50 tick retracements, 100 tick runs, not unusual. Spazzy Wazzy running all over the place, right? 
So what I'm trying to say to you is that is that a scalp move on ES could be as small as two or three ticks. And a runner might be 20. A runner might be 12. You might be lucky to get 11 in a move. Now, NASDAQ, on the other hand, a scalp might be 10 or 15, and you're looking for a 50 tick move. Let's put the ones in the middle. Now, this has changed over time. This wasn't, it's not the way it used to be, but let's just do it this way. I would put RTY more towards the, the, the slow to medium area, kind of, kind of right in here. And depending on the day, YM can be more on the, on the larger side because when it can jerk you around and then when it runs, it just takes off. So I put it more towards the spazzy side. So this is going to take a little bit of work on your part. You're going to have to go in and study your instrument. You're going to have to look at how it, did, how it traded on Friday, look at how it traded Thursday, look at Wednesday morning, look at these moves, look at the retracements, see how far it pulls back, where it gets support and resistance, how far does it move before it bounces again. I put crude oil um, and the spectrum probably more up in here. Let's use some rule of thumbs. Let's, let, let me help you out a little bit. Let's let's try let's get some rule of thumbs in here. I'd put crude oil sort of more up in here, and I put gold more kind of on this side right here, like this. So let's let's for the heck of it, let's just go ahead and put in some numbers here. So in terms of scalps, because the question on the table is this: the question on the table is. What is an appropriate scalp size for the instrument that I'm looking to trade? That's really what you want to know, right? So let's just get some kind of rule of thumb numbers, and then you're going to pinky swear with me that you're going to go look at this this weekend, okay? Everybody pinky swearing? I got my pinky out here. We're all going to swear together. We're going to study this. Because let's face it, we're all lazy. Who's lazier than me? I don't know. I don't think anybody. I'm pretty lazy. I'm as lazy as it gets. I don't want to do anything, right? So let me help you out a little bit. <laughs> Shane says me. I'm lazy too. All right, cool. I, I understand. So down here at the lower end for ES, you're looking at like two to three ticks. Now that doesn't sound like much, but it's 1250 a tick. So three tick scalp is 3750. Now you can put more on there too. You could scalp 10 contracts on ES, no problem. Num num num, gobble it up, need it. Here on GC and Russell, you're looking at more like four to six. When you study it, you're going to notice that when you get a pop, you're going to get like a four to six scalp. In fact, I would I would say Russell, Gold, YM, and CL, you're looking at, I'm going to say, four to eight. Six being the sweet spot in this area right here for a scalp. Right? This is scalp ticks. And um, depending on how Spazzy's running that day, I'd, I'd go the upper end of the spectrum, eight to ten plus. Now, it doesn't forgive you for looking at the chart and trying to figure this out for yourself so that Monday, come Monday morning, you know these numbers in the back of your head. Everybody says, well, what's the scalp? What should the initial target be? When should I move my – this just stop to break even. Well, I mean, yeah, I, you know, we, I mean, we can give you all the tools and help you figure it out, but you've got to do some work to go look at it and say, okay, what should I have done this day? Should I have had a 12-tick initial stop, pulled off a scalp at six ticks, and then moved my stop down two ticks behind break even? Do that exercise a couple of times and see if you stopped out or whether it wiggled around and you had and the trade worked out for you. Everybody see that? Who's pinky swearing with me? I got my pinky up. You're gonna do a little bit of work this weekend. You're gonna look at your instrument on this spectrum, right? You're gonna figure out should my scalp be four, six, eight, two, whatever. Okay, I see some pinky swears. Good. All right, let's do one more. What, let's pop one other instrument up here. We're almost out of time. What do you want to see before we wrap up? Russell, you want to see the Russell? Let's take a quick vote of the team. What do you want to see? Let's take a quick vote before we wrap. We're almost out of time. And I will put one more instrument in front of you. Okay, I got a Russell. We got a couple of CLs. All right, let's do this. Let me see if I can squeak in real quick. 
Let me squeak in a rustle and let me squeak in a crude. Let's let's get her done. Let's just get her done. Everybody understand what we're doing here? Risk managed all the way. See if I could find a good Russell trade for you. All right, let's do an exercise together. Let's. Oh, wait a minute! I didn't answer that final. I didn't. There was one thing I haven't addressed yet. And now is a good time to do it. Now is a good time to do it. Let's forget about the instrument we're looking at it for just a second, because there was a, there was something that we talked about that I have not addressed yet. And let's talk about it right now, because this happened on Friday morning with the Russell. This happened with the Russell. So we're going to look at this a couple of different ways. And I'd like to do it like such. And I'm going to help you to, to see this ahead of time. Now, when you look at the Russell on Friday morning, was the Russell going up, down, or sideways? From 6.30 on, this is the open of the equity market right here. Was the Russell going up, down, or sideways from this point forward, the open in the equity market? Up, down, or sideways? What say you, team? What say you to the magic question? The question that has the magic beans at the end of it. All right, I see some mixed answers coming in. That's good. Sideways to up seems to be the predominant answer. Sideways to up. Now, let's see why we might say that. Let's take a look at why we might say that. Well, a true bona fide uptrend would look something more like this. Right? Like in gold, right? Like we looked at on gold. Higher lows, higher highs, predominantly blue bars. There's, uh, bands in the mid-band are all stepping up. You can see it's it's uh, pulling back, holding support, bouncing higher. So from here to here, it was pretty clear we were in an uptrend. So what's the first thing we do in the morning when we get ready to trade? Here's 6.30 coming up right here. Here's 6.30. Here's, here's 6.30 coming up. You're getting ready to trade. You're getting ready to trade the Russell. What's the first thing we do? The very, very first thing we do. What's the thing that you do when you look at a chart in the morning? What is the most critical, one of the most critical things you can do? Right, support and resistance lines. Now, could you put a support resistance line somewhere in here? Yep. Could you put a support resistance line somewhere up in here? Yep. Could you draw an uptrend ray that looks something like this? Yep. Let's make it a little bigger. So you're kind of in an uptrend. But you have resistance up in this area right here, and you've got support down in this area right here. So let's advance the chart. Now, here's a critical question. Right in this area right here, the uptrend line was broken right here. And then it subsequently went down into this area right here. Is this a trend change, yes or no, right here? Trend change, yes or no?
Simple question. Type in a Y or an N. Is that a trend change? Yes or no? Broke the trend line. Here's the trend line. Trend line's broken. That's a, that's, I was reading in a school book the other day that it breaks the trend line. It's a change of trend. Trend change, right? Yeah, that's a trend change, right? No. Right. Good. You are simply checking support f from the pre-market session, and it bounces. So the answer in this question was sideways to up. That was correct. Technically, you're still in an uptrend. However, you are starting to go sideways. Now, how big is this range? Well, 2150-ish to 25 is uh, 37 ticks. Is this range tradable? Now, if you say the range is tradable, is the mid-band a good trade in a range? So let me ask you this question. Here's how I'm going to put it right here. Range equal mid-band trades. And that's the question. Let me help you out. Is it a good idea to trade a, to trade the mid band when the mid band is in the middle of the range? Here's the top of the range. Here's the bottom of the range. And here's the mid band. Is is generally speaking is the mid band a trade you should be taking in a range? That's a yes or no. These are pretty simple questions, right? It's not complicated. Either you, either you do or you don't. Generally speaking, if well, in, in, uh, it, Robert says only if it's a very large range like 50 ticks. That's true. That's true. That's the one. So generally, the, generally speaking, the answer to this question is going to be no for the most part, because most ranges tend to be in the 20, 25, 30 tick range, and there's not enough meat on the bone to go from here to here once you factor in slippage and commissions. By the time you get filled out of here on a close of a bar and you get out up here fading the top, there's not a lot of meat on the bone here. If it's a huge range and it's very tradable, there's an, and there's an occasion where you could be able to take that if this from here to here is at least 20, 25 plus ticks or 30 ticks. So the overall range is like 50, 60, and there's meat on the bone to get down here. Well, then yes, but that's pretty rare. Normally, ranges are a lot tighter. There's no meat on the bone. So look at it this way. If you got short on this bar right here, Say you had a box and you took the short, and then it bounces right here, and you're trying to get out, fading that swing by here. So this is your trade. This is actually your trade. Your trade would be this. Can you make any profit with that? Is there any profit in here? By the time you get in on a close of the bar and you get it in there, get out, less a little slippage in commission? No, there's no meat here. This is not a trade. In other words, so, so let me round this discussion out like such. If the, if the direction of the market is sideways to up, as we had here in the case of the Russell, is your primary mode of entry to get long from support, so that's a buy, B, or L for long. Now, let's do L for long. So your primary mode of entry is long, L. Your primary mode is S, shorting the top of the range, and then covering at the bottom. S would be your vote there. Or trade both sides. You're buying support, and that would be B, both. Long and short. You're shorting the top. You're buying. You're covering at the bottom. You're getting long down here. Shorting, getting out of your long, reversing, getting short, both. Now remember the side the the the, uh, the trend is sideways to up. So are you mainly getting long, mainly getting short, or are you trading both sides of the range? Other two seconds. Type in your vote. L for long, S for short, B for both. In the range you're looking at on the Russell Friday morning, right here. Primary mode of entry. Time's up. Long only. Until the trend changes otherwise. You're buying support. So when you come down into support, you buy it. 
you need a robot to do it. You might. Well, that's what, what is the other option? What is the other option? There is there is a third option for everybody. You know that a third or fourth option, right? So it's long, short, both, or what? Because that, that that's kind of the obvious. That that, that you know. That goes without saying that, you know, there is another option. Stay out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know lots of traders over all these years. They come and they say, you know what, Charles, I got to tell you something. I am just not a range-bound trader. I've done everything I can in the world to learn how to trade those ranges, and every time I do, I get my butt kicked all over the place. I just can't trade ranges. And, and I've tried different instruments, different settings fading different amounts i just can't do it i just i can't see it i get creamed every time so what do you think that person should do keep trying to keep trading ranges put more capital at risk maybe i'm talking about you somebody in here today stay out don't do it if you lose money every time doing it and you've made a bona fide effort to try to learn to do it then don't do it now let's look at the long trades in this range it's like being locked in the closet with a light off. <laughs> Let's look at the long trades on pullbacks and see if they worked out. Okay, here's one right there. That worked out. Went right to the top of the range. There's a mid-band bounce that took out the top. There's another pullback right in close to support within a few ticks of it. Bounces, hits mid-band, takes it out, gets a fresher high. Sideways to up. Sideways to up. Now, look, if you were avoiding all of this till about 7 o'clock, if you just said, look, I'm just going to put a big box around here, Charles. I understand what you're saying, you and your fancy ranges and all manner of whatever you're talking about there. But I want some evidence that I've got myself an uptrend, and when I see it, I'm going to start taking the trades. Okay. Well, then maybe you waited until this trade right here. Here's one that came just before 7.30. Right here, sat on the mid band. In fact, now your support, your resistance starting to turn into almost support. Right here. All right, I got to wrap up. I got to, I got to, I got to get.